Okay. Minya, can you still hear us? Yes, can hear us. I hear everybody. Let's see what this says here. Minya says I have no sound. Okay. We can hear you. We don't, Minya's not talking though. No. <laughs> But I heard her just before. No, I don't think so. Our best go in, best to go into the compute her computer and just start over. Yeah. Yeah, she uh, still isn't because if there's any suggestions. Let's see. So I'm gonna write down try a restart. That's what I just told her. Yeah. Restart. I don't think it happened to be once. I just had to restart totally the computer. How do you spell Minya? M I N A? I A. I A? That's what I have. Okay. To Minya. Here she is. Well, do you want to go ahead and get started, Rabbi, and then see if Minya can come back in? Sure. Okay. Let's go ahead and start with the blessing. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the world, who has sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us to engage in the words of hope. Amen. Amen. Uh, Go ahead. Um, um, we I went through um the uh, program for um the next three or four months, and Charlotte typed it up. So was this distributed yet? I yeah. think so. No, I didn't get it. No, I didn't get it. Yeah. But you know, we're we're good till um September twenty seventh. Okay, so we may, I did from September 22nd all the way till April 10th. Oh, I have to look and see. And does Steve have that? Do you have that, I Steve? Do. Yes, yes. So, Charlotte, you can talk to Charlotte about distributing that if you like. The, uh, she sent it out yesterday. Oh, so it's on that last email that we yes. got? Okay. Yes. I just, okay. my email, I did not get it yet. Okay. I didn't look. I there's, just signed in and I didn't look really. There. I don't think yeah, I got it. It's there. Okay. Well, if you didn't get it, let me know and I'll talk to Charlotte and we'll check what happens. We probably got it. We just got to pay attention to the emails, you know. There, there were four attachments. Okay. Yeah. There were four attachments. Here's, here's the email. email. One, two, three, four. Okay. So it must be an Excel. Your PDF. That's it. that's not it. Excel. Okay, where does this go to? That's not the right that says September twenty third. That's not it. Okay. Well that's the last one I got. Last no let's September twentieth was the Yeah, was that's what I see on that. Yeah, that's not right. That's what you are. September 20th is the last one I got. Yeah. yeah. I had one a couple weeks ago that said the 27th. Huh. No, no, it's not the 20th. Yes, it's the 27th. Yeah. The Heritage of the Congregation of Jacob. That's the last one that I got. But I don't see that calendar on there. That attachment isn't there. Well, one of us can call Charlotte after class or something and ask her to send it out. Okay, okay. let's go and get started then. Okay, well, thank you, Steve. And so we are now on page uh, 151. Everybody can hear and see me okay? Yeah. You're yeah. bigger than usual. I'm bigger <laughs> than <laughs> usual. It's clearer Your than phone. usual, I think. Oh, well, this phone. is my phone. It's amazing that the phone... The little phone works better than the laptops. I don't know why. Yep. So um, um, we're talking about marriage and divorce, and particularly divorce. Um, marriage in Judaism was always a very vague phenomena. 
you could easily get married. It's easy to get married and it's hard to get divorced. I guess that mimics real life as well. You know, you you hear um, these celebrities go to Las Vegas and they arrive on an afternoon flight and the next morning they're married. And uh, but then when they divorce, it takes years and there's war and there's lawyers and there's custody mm-hmm. battles and mm-hmm. there's money. <laughs> money. Right. Elvis will marry you, but not divorce you. huh? And if it's Johnny Depp, you know, they throw things at each other and cut off people's fingers. And it's, uh, you know, it's much more complicated. And so similarly in Judaism. Um, however, as we know, we're separating what's in the Bible from what's in later Jewish tradition. And as I've spoken about a number of times, we're, we're missing that middle period, which is the period where there were all these different sects, S-E-C-T-S, and that Judaism was quite variegated, quite a, di- a variety of different types of Judaisms. What we have is the early biblical period because we have the Bible, and then we have the later period where we have the Talmud. And in between, there was a lot of stuff going on, much of which we don't know. I was speaking to a uh, rab- a conservative rabbi from San Diego a couple days ago, and he's quite a scholar. He uh, published his book on Philo and Maimonides on the Torah, some very interesting stuff. And he was saying that there were probably about 100 sects during the Second Temple period. And each group had their own interpretations of, you know, of the Torah. So you could say at that point that Judaism was groups of Jews who interpreted the Torah in different ways. Later, after the destruction of the Temple, you really only have one group left, the rabbis. And the Talmud becomes the authoritative book. But in between, there's a lot. So therefore, um, how much do we know about marriage and particularly divorce as it developed? Not that much. You know, so, um, so for example, Philo, who was a Jewish philosopher in Alexandria in the first century. In other words, he lived, you know, a few years before the destruction of the temple. What did he do? What did he not do? What practices that we know as Jewish did he practice? Which did he not know about? Which did he know about but didn't practice? It's very hard to say. Anyway, so that's my introduction about marriage and divorce in theory. Pam, you want to start us off with any comments? Yes. Um, my, I think in general... Uh, Jews handle marriage and divorce better than Christians. <laughs> in what way? In well, what I, way? I think there's less drama. From what I know from friends and relatives who have gotten a divorce, you know, it it it, it didn't become a drama thing. It became, you know, a, a transactional decision to uh, go separate ways. So that's my two cents. Okay. And what about marriage? Do uh, Jews handle marriage with less drama as well? Yeah, that I'm not sure of. <laughs> Depends on who's marrying who. And okay. in what part of the country? Oh, so, what part of the country makes a difference? Yes. Because if uh, you can, how so? Well, if you in the word marriage. Are you incorporating the ceremony and all the to do? Yes, yeah, the ceremony, yeah. Well, they get overboard very often in the East Coast. I mean, yeah, but also the Jewish ceremony is can get so complicated. The Orthodox was seven times right. each way and all that stuff. That's sh- seven brachas and yeah. Well, the wedding last week we did at the temple. Was anyone there? Do we have any of the poll holders? We had four volunteer poll holders from the temple. And the bride, um, you you mo- you saw her at the services, her and her husband. 
So mm-hmm. she said, I, she said, yeah, I'll go seven times around the groom. I said, you're not going to get dizzy? She said, no. <laughs> and she did it. No problem. So I guess it depends on the person. Well, I, I was referring more to the parties that are held in seven different homes for the okay. people that just got married. Yes. So there's a tradition after the wedding in Orthodoxy to have a, a <laughs> sh- one of the Sheva Brachot set for seven nights following the wedding in different homes. So you, you so in Orthodoxy, there's no tradition of going for a honeymoon immediately after the wedding, yeah. right? Like in the graduate. <laughs> uh, remember that wedding? Yeah. That didn't go so well. But we don't do that in the Jewish wedding. We don't say, um, you know, if there's anyone who objects to this marriage, speak now or forever hold your peace. We definitely don't do that. No reason to... To, you know, we have enough problematic people. We don't have to encourage them, right? For sure. If if I said that in every group, there'd be somebody who'd say, this is my chance. <laughs> okay, other comments? Evelyn, Bernie, um, Shirley? No, other than today's mores are diametrically opposed to what was written in the Torah. And what goes today was forbidden at that time. And so it's a different society, a different culture, different values. And so we look at marriage somewhat differently, I think. And today, so many couples are deciding not to get married, but cohabitate, as it were. Or if they do get married, they decide not to have children, which was the original purpose. In other words, to perpetuate the species, as it were. Um, it, 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 today's values seem to be just completely opposite of of what was. Uh-huh. And, and uh, it's it's hard to relate to what was then. You read it as historical information rather than something that we would particularly adhere to today. Isn't that strange how things have changed so much? Quickly, too. So, right. So like, so how many of you, your parents would have been upset if you'd lived with a boyfriend or girlfriend? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, <laughs> no, Steve, your parents would have well, I was going to comment the fact that, you know, uh, today, a couple of my cousins had destination weddings. So you had to go either to, um, you know, the West Coast, like L.A. or some places like that, Santa Monica, and uh, they would have destination weddings, whereas back in my day, <laughs> that was kind of not heard of that much. Wasn't heard of. So, and and the whole family expenses. My gosh. Um. Yeah. Well, I did a destination wedding in Dominican Republic a couple months ago. You know, when I went off there to Punta Cana, and that everybody came from the East Coast, and uh, and they they were very proud. Every person they invited came. How big a wedding was it? I think they had 80 guests, 85 wow. guests. What? And every person they invited came. Then they must have had the resources to do that because that becomes a very costly. Very costly. Very. Well, yeah. yes and no, but they, you know, if they had done, I mean, it's costly for the guests who have to pay for the. That's uh, what I'm talking about. Yeah. But the for the guests. couple, it cost about the same as doing right. it in New Jersey. Right. You know, or less, you know, so uh, so uh, it wasn't costly for them. But but for the uh, for the yes. guests they have to pay for airfare, they have to pay for hotel. If it was in New mm. Jersey, you just drive from your house mostly. So. So, yes. Um, OK. Uh, other. Uh, uh, so. So um, uh, any other comments or if not, we'll. St- uh, OK, Marsha. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the. Uh... The Torah version of divorce is very centered 
around men, men's and women's relations, which are totally different now than they were then. And that's what Evelyn was talking about. It's, uh, you know, it, it all revolves around whether the man is going to give them the, that give the woman the divorce or not, you know? And so he holds all the cards, if you will, you know, on whether this is going to happen. Then uh, people, once we've gotten past orthodoxy, uh, modern people don't want to live that way. I mean, it's more of an equal society of men and women, especially when it comes to marriage. Maybe not in um, all ways, but in marriage. And, and reform just did away with the whole get. Yeah. So, you know, because... We accept that that Judaism for us is religion, not civil law, and therefore civil law, which involves the marriage license and the divorce document, is a civil matter. Um, the Orthodox are concerned because if, or they used to be concerned, if a Jewish couple get divorced civilly without a get, and then the woman has more children with another man, whether she's married or not, those kids would technically be a mamzerim or bastards. And they would be, you have to ostracize them. Oh. So um, so mm -hmm. they, they were upset about this. And one of my childhood acquaintances set up an organization to encourage non-Orthodox Jews to get a get. But that didn't go very far as you might imagine. And um, most, I don't how many, I'm, well, I won't ask anything too personal, but um, I would imagine that if we had people here who were divorced from a Jewish partner, that they probably did not get a get. But everyone, yes, Steve. I was divorced and no, I did not get it. We did not get a get. All right. So, and if your wife was Jewish and if she, she was and, Jewish. But she didn't have any inclination as to getting to get. And did she? She didn't have any children with anyone else afterwards. No, no other children. So then it doesn't matter. But if she did, then it would technically affect the children. Right. In Reform Judaism, also we would have problems with that because we we mm -hmm. don't we're not comfortable with children getting problems from the parents. So, in other words, the idea that your children would be stigmatized for something that you did or didn't do is not uh, an idea that we're comfortable with necessarily. So if Bernie does terrible things, we can be mad at Bernie, but we can't be married, mad at his children, certainly not his grandchildren, right? That's not fair. No, it's not. You know, I mean, in theory. They, they used yeah. to be for uh, the inheritance rights when it was more of a Judaic lineage of heritage rights than than civil now okay who'd like to start reading we're on page 151 and uh it's called peric bet marriage and divorce i'll read and i'll start okay thank you evelyn Parashat Kitetse discusses both the institution of marriage and the process of divorce. <laughs> men choose their wives and have the right to divorce them. If a wife lies about being a virgin at the time of the marriage, she may be stoned to death. If a woman fails to please her husband because he finds something obnoxious about her, he may divorce her. There are few hints that affection is the basis of marriage relationships. There is no indication of mutuality or equal rights for women in choosing a husband or seeking a divorce. Okay, stop. So, uh, and this is from Genesis chapter 24, verse 67, which is not our Parsha, right? So Fields is just bringing in information from elsewhere right now so we're not we're talking we're in parsha kitetse which is in which book deuteronomy thank you so we're at the end of the torah and deuteronomy is written presumably two or three hundred years after uh genesis but still he's bringing from earlier to, just to summarize some of the stuff 
And uh, what he says is basically, you know, the men have more of the uh, power than women. And that makes sense, you know, in those times. Today, women have more power than men. And if you've seen the Barbie movie, then maybe men shouldn't even be involved in marriage at all. <laughs> but, uh, oops. but um, you know, but that's a... a, a uh, uh, bi biblical, I'm going to write a book, Biblical Exegesis and the Barbie Movie. Okay. <laughs> uh, Rabbi? Yes, uh, Evelyn. Even in those days, wasn't um, ma material advantage in, in a marriage? In other words, uh, if a man married a woman, was it advantageous in terms of monies or properties that were transferred from one to the other? Um, it's rare that we read about in ancient times that affection or mutual interest or love was um, part of the marriage. If it was, they were lucky. But more often as not from what we've read, even in those early times, it seems to me that it had to be something that had to do with property or money. Even, even with Jacob working for... 14 years to get the love of his life, there was, um, he had to work. And yeah, it was a transaction. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but, but that's a good example where clearly some, you know, many p people in those times, just like today, you know, fell in love. You know, he wanted to marry Rachel. He could have married another girl quicker, much quicker. But he wanted to marry Rachel. The only difference today is people don't wear veils, and the the ceremony would involve looking at the other person in the eyes. So you wouldn't be able your father in law wouldn't be able to 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 marry off uh, an other another sibling, um, and pretend it's the one you want. But clearly, Jacob loved Rachel, and Rachel loved Jacob, and so it's like our, our, a Jewish version of the uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet. And clearly, people had affairs because they were also in love or they were in lust. So da King David and Bathsheba, for example. I mean, so people don't change. I mean, I think that the same... You know, and then there were people that just got married because it was expected of them and they didn't really, they weren't too engaged in it. So I don't think it's that, I don't think people are different, but certainly the writers of the book of Deuteronomy are looking at it more in a rather um, practical manner. They're not interested in the, in the uh, drama of it and the love aspect. They're they're just interested. Well, what happens? Who pays who? Who has? Who makes what choices? Who gets to choose? Uh, Marsha is reminding me of the whole fiddler on the roof story with the various couples that were getting together. Oh, do you love me? <laughs> do you love me? exactly for twenty five years? <laughs> yeah. Doing your dishes, doing your clothes. <laughs> But do you love me? <laughs> right. Well, you know, the concept of love is an amorphous concept, right? So it's abstract. It's, uh, you know, what is love? You know? And uh, so nobody really knows what love is. But here, um, there were grounds for divorce that we wouldn't normally see as grounds for divorce, and they weren't necessarily equal. So, um, and the rabbis later are going to try to even it out somewhat. But this is the bit, so what we have so far. Okay, who'd like to read? We're at the very bottom 151 in the right column. I'll continue if no else wants. Okay, Evelyn, you're on. Okay, in interpreting the Torah's description of marriage and divorce, the commentators raise significant questions they inquire about the purpose of marriage, 
explore its emotional and legal consequences and examine the appropriate conditions and rituals for divorce. As with other subjects, it is the interpreters who over the centuries unlock new understandings and initiate new rituals. In doing so, they adapt the commandments of Torah to new conditions of society and to new moral sensibilities. Marriage and divorce are important examples of such dynamic change and evolution within Jewish tradition. After describing the creation in heaven and earth, the Torah reports that God comments, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a fitting helper for him. In answer to loneliness, God creates woman and declares, a man will leave his father and mother and cling to his wife so that they become one flesh. Within this early description, the Torah advances the view that marriage provides mutual support, total trust, caring, and companionship. Husband and wife are helpers to each other. They are to be inseparable, one flesh, both physically and spiritually. Together, they form a sacred new world through which they create a family. Okay, stop there. You know, I'm trying to keep a clear differentiation between what the Torah says and what the Talmud says, because we're talking about several hundred years and a lot of uh, a lot of changes uh, so so far i think most of what we've said is from the torah what is your impressions any any comments about this yes bernie um one thing that strikes me is that this is somewhat incompatible with the concept that they could have many wives what where why? This, this last paragraph about the one flesh and, and all that is uh, sort of incompatible with th that other concept. Uh huh. Um, okay. Um, okay. Uh, well, um, Pam, Pam is agreeing. So, um, good point, Bernie. So, Bernie, you want to ban multiple wives? No, I'm just commenting. I'm not okay. taking a position. <laughs> <laughs> because that was one of the big benefits of Judaism. You know, you could have four wives. But and I'm not, that's a benefit. Or as no. many <laughs> as, as you could keep happy. <laughs> it's not a benefit. Gates that um, one is what he's saying yeah yeah so there's a nice um yeah well i mean i guess um not everything is the the ideal and uh and and really the only the only reason it was banned was uh it was only banned in christian countries it was banned because the rabbis thought it would make Jews look bad in comparison to Christians. So because Christians were only allowed one wife, Rabbeinu Gershom Meor Gola, or somebody in his circle around the 10th century in, in Northern Europe, made a prohibition. But in Sephardic countries, the Jewish men were technically allowed to marry up to four women. But how often they married more than one is not clear. Doesn't seem like it was very common. Financially, he would have to be very well off to be able to support four women and the ensuing children and keep them in the style that he expected his family to be in. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that was yeah. why usually it was the, the very, very wealthy who could do that. The average, the average common wouldn't have been able to. I don't know if you saw the TV series about 10 years ago with Tom Paxton. I think it was called One Love, about a Mormon breakaway group where the, the husband, played by Tom Paxton, had 
three wives. Um, Steve Siegel. Yes. Well, it also too, depending on, on your father-in-law, if your father-in-law was rich, he would take you in and probably set you up in his business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, you know, you would compensate for, you know, maybe his son-in-law's shortcomings. Huh. So having a rich father-in-law would be good, and I don't know how that father-in-law would react if you had three other wives. Well, uh, Pam. <laughs> good point. Um, Pam. The Muslims allow multiple wives, right? Uh, to this day, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, but certainly traditionally, yes. I mean, they have the same, which is, you know, the same thing as the Sephardic Jews, because, uh, yeah, hmm. I think they were allowed up to four wives yeah. as well. But I've never heard of a Muslim having more than one wife in, in, in America anyway. It would be big in the... <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Marsha. You have to unmute, Marsha. Unmute. See that? Okay, I'm you sorry. Uh, I, I don't, I never thought about it. Do the Muslims have something like a get also? Do they have an equal sort of situation? Um, yes. Oh. I don't know exactly what it's called, but yeah, they have similar. Uh-huh. I didn't even know that. But, you know, I, I mean, we comparing the differences and similarities would be beyond my abilities, but but that would be an interesting thing. That's a very interesting thing that you raised because I've never heard anyone talking about that. I hadn't either, so I, didn't, I absolutely didn't know, yeah. What are the similarities and differences between Judaism and Islam in terms of divorce? Interesting. That would be very interesting. But not just divorce and just lining up the two well, religions. Well, See, when you consider that Islam is developed from Judaism, there would be certain similarities. Some. How many? I don't know. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, and the the I I met one iman who's from Glendale. Very nice. I think he's from Albania. And uh, so it would be interesting to hear him speak on some of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we might find that in some ways, Islam and Judaism are more similar than Islam and Christianity. Oh, yeah. uh, Steve, is that a hand? No, no, no. I'm just reading and checking to see how many Muslims can have wives, how many wives can move them back. It and what's the answer? It didn't specify. Oh, well. Hang on just a second. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Now that they, they've, they've abolished it so far. Oh. So, why can't I have one wife? Well, but then you hear about these sheiks, you know, certainly 50, 75 years ago, they definitely had multiple wives, at least in the movies. So. <laughs> Uh, I think in Saudi Arabia, I think it was they still had multiple wives. You hear of the the children being rivals with each other because the mothers were different, and um, it <laughs> not much different now than it was fifty uh, five hundred years ago. So it's um, in some of the Middle Eastern countries, I think it still holds. Right, I think the guy that's going to take over Saudi Arabia. He was in competition with some of his father's other children from other wives. Yeah. And, and uh, also, though, in North Korea, they had that. But uh, maybe the wives were not married to the husband at the same time. But remember, the North Korean dictator, he yeah. assassinated one of his half brothers. Right. But it wasn't from the same mother. It was, uh, you know, different mothers. But that didn't mean that the father was married to more than one wife at the same time. So there's such a thing as serial, you know, um, non-monogamy. Serial monogamy, yeah. yeah. Which is different than, you know, having more than one wife at the same time. Okay, um, Evelyn will... 
Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. Here we go. I, who who a, had their hand up? Minya. 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 Hi, Minya. Hi. There is a TV um, series called Sister Wives. Yeah. It's a Mormon show uh -huh. where the man has, I don't know how many, three, four, I don't know, but they're called Sister Wives. And I personally can't imagine how you live like that, um, mm -hmm. having to share your husband and then working it out with all the children. But I just thought I'd mention it in case anyone was interested, but the Mormons apparently still do have multiple wives. And that's like an entertaining show? It's on TLC. Okay. You recommend it? No, I'd never watch it. <laughs> uh, I just know that it's there. <laughs> I have watched it and it's very interesting. <laughs> is it? There it is, TLC, Sister do the, Wives. Do the women complain about being married, you know, three or four of them to one husband? That was a oh, right. the, there, but there was this congresswoman from California. She had to resign because she was in what they call a thruple. <laughs> but they're not married. They just they're two women with one man and they're all living together. Yeah. But but she was married to her husband and then they had one of her aides was part of that. But but the problem was it was an aide. Somebody who worked for her. But they weren't married. The third person wasn't married. I mean, you can. It would be illegal, right? So how do the Mormons do it? Then? American laws are not compatible with this whole approach. It's uh, yeah. it, it's a uh, it's a hard. If this is what you believe, it would be hard to be in America. You'd have to move to Saudi Arabia, maybe. Right. Okay, Evelyn. Back to you. So we're moving now from biblical comments to um to rabbinic comments and the biblical comments we could say are pretty short they favor the man in certain ways they seem to be not terribly emotionally based um but that doesn't mean people were like that it just means that um you know the the people who wrote the book of deuteronomy you know were interested in the legal stuff okay now we're moving on to the the, the talmud Okay. Early rabbinic commentators stress the importance of marriage. Rabbi Akiba remarks that a man who does not marry impairs the divine image, meaning that love and marriage are the will of God. Rabbi Jacob teaches that he who does not have a wife lives without joy, without blessing, without a helper, without goodness, and without atonement. Some add without Torah and moral protection. And Rabbi Ben Ula adds, without peace. The author of the mystical commentary, the Zohar, underscores the centrality of marriage by claiming that since finishing the creation of the world, God has been busy with creating new worlds by bringing together bridegrooms and brides. Since marriage perpetuates life and fills it with love, nothing has greater value. Marriage concludes, the author of the Zohar, keeps God in the world because God's presence dwells in the love between husband and wife. While the Torah makes reference to a man marrying a woman, it does not describe any ceremony or ritual. Later rabbinic tradition defines three aspects of marriage ritual, shadukhin, or engagement, erosin, or betrothal, and nisuin, or marriage vows. Originally, these three rituals were celebrated at different times. Later, erosin and nisuin were merged into the wedding ceremony called getushin, kedushin, or holiness. Okay, stop there. So... Uh, in the Talmudic period, you had three stages. You had a, a shiduchim, where you'd meet and the families would agree on, I guess, what you call an engagement. That still is sort of done. Then you'd had erusim, which is betrothal, and that would be a second, like, engagement kind of thing. Now, after erusim, the couple are legally wedded but they're not wedded. 
if that makes sense. So later the rabbis said, we can't have this because um, Irusim, you know, after Irusim, let's say there was still six months before the Nisuim, they weren't married, they weren't living together, but legally they were. So if, let's say, the woman has an affair, then it's adultery. But this is ridiculous because they weren't married, they weren't living together, nothing like that. So it didn't make sense to have this long period between Erosim and Nisuim. So now in the marriage ceremony, you have both ceremonies together. So when I do a wedding ceremony, there's Erosim and there's Nisuim. And therefore, you don't have a problem of having a long period between one and the other. Okay. Any comments? If not, then Evelyn, you can keep going. Uh, Marsha, there's a comment. You, I'm asking, when you're doing a wedding ceremony, is it actually two parts of the service that are the uh, the engagement and the wedding part of it? Yeah, like in the old rabbi's manual, it would say, this is part is Erosim, this part is the Nisuim. Oh, really? Today, I give so many choices to the couple, and it's so much based on what they find spiritually meaningful. I don't worry about Erosim and Nisuim. So a lot of what was traditional may not be emphasized or even may not be there. Uh -huh. But but nothing I do is halachic anyway, so <laughs> it, it doesn't really matter. You know, an Orthodox rabbi is not going to accept anything I do. So does it, you, do you need a rabbi to marry you? Is that a necessity? Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. With Without a rabbi, how's the rabbi going to make a living? Except for that. <laughs> it was a for me, that's a pretty important thing. <laughs> well, I realize that, but what about a civil ceremony or things like do that? Civil? Why couldn't you do a civil? Um, a rabbi not, you're you. not going to get out of me what you want, Marsha. I think that without a rabbi, the whole marriage is doomed to catastrophe from the beginning. Oh, my. It's a very good investment. <laughs> and it's certainly good from the rabbi's point of view to keep Absolutely. Absolutely. food on the table. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, to answer that seriously, no, I guess you you don't. And and a lot of couples today are are uh, are doing their own thing. I mean, with everything. So you'll have people that will um, that they, they, they get their friend to send for a, you know, ten dollar, you know, instant minister certificate. I don't even know if they need that. They could just simply claim that they're a rabbi and nobody, you know, uh, uh, most states are not interested in questioning religion. I always so, wondered if somebody just walks into any congregation, Jewish or otherwise, and says, I'm of this religion and I want to join. Nobody ever questions it or vets them or anything like that. You just accept it, you know? Um, but when I was in South Africa, I had to produce all my credentials, copies of, and take this very uh, extensive test. And, you know, they would only let rabbis or ministers be marriage officiants if they, you know, were, were very legit. Hmm. But, um, but, but here, basically anyone can do it. So. I don't have to register with the Maricopa County. Um, they don't know where I went to school or what I studied or what grades I got or how brilliant a rabbi I really am. And uh, at the wedding, there's a certificate and everybody signs it and I sign it as the officiant. And I sit, use my signature and then it asks me to write out my name. And that's it. And they don't ask for my email or my phone number or my address or my synagogue or where I went to school or anything like that. So basically, so, getting a get is a matter of a moral thing in, in the couple's or their families and their families' views. 
So whether they go that far to have to get a get, you know. Well, the, the, we're talking about the marriage uh, certificate from Maricopa County, but ye, but yes, what, what you're saying is correct. Me, Minya was. Yeah, uh, Minya had her hand up. My daughter-in-law just left for New Jersey, where she's going to be the officiate at a wedding. Uh -huh. And well, what is her background? Has nothing to do with anything religious because she just took a class or some sessions or whatever online and they send her a certificate and she's going to be marrying her friends in New Jersey. All right. So I I, I want to condemn Minya's daughter-in-law in the strongest terms for taking business away from rabbis. No, I don't think so. Yeah. But you see, in America today, there's no reason why um, <coughs> why people wouldn't do that, right? There's no there's no impediment to that. <clears throat> Any other comments? Okay, Evelyn, back to you. Okay, just before the wedding ceremony, a ketubah or written agreement between husband and wife is signed. The ketubah functioned throughout the centuries as a prenuptial agreement, spelling out the obligations assumed by the husband in marriage. These included support, food, clothing, shelter, and sexual relations. It also specified fixed financial arrangements should the couple divorce. Many Jews continue to use the ancient formulas for their ketubah. Others choose a ketubah that is more egalitarian in its language, making clear the mutual responsibilities and commitments of husband and wife. Yeah, so Harvey Fields wrote this book 40 years ago. Today, no Jews... No, no non-Orthodox Jews use a traditional ketubah. You know, I've never, I've never signed in the last twenty years. I've never seen a traditional ketubah. You know, only about half the couples have a ketubah, and the ones maybe two thirds, and the ones they pick off the internet something that strikes them as you know sounding nice. So it's no longer a legal document in non-Orthodox Judaism. Now, now the couples that come to me may not may or may not be typical. I don't know. You know, I don't I don't live in a place like uh, northern New Jersey where there might be a lot of much more traditional Jews who might still come to a reform rabbi. You know, so most people that come to me to get married inside the congregation or outside the congregation are fairly assimilated. Yeah. So maybe it's not typical, but the ketubah is still a nice custom. You can order one from ketubah, ketubah.com for $200 and up. They come with pretty pictures. Yeah, the, my daughter um, belongs to a conservative temple. She and my son-in-law are both very conservative. Sometimes I think they're going on orthodox, but that's beside the point. When they were married, they did have a very beautiful ketubah, which is actually framed and is over there, the headboard of their bedroom. And, the, and uh, it's a very beautiful document, and it was signed. There was a, a much more elaborate ceremony than one would find, let's say, in the Reformed Temple. And... Um, uh, it's. I think the con many of the in the conservative uh, movement still believe in having a ketubah, having a ketubah signing ceremony, and all that goes with it. So, I think it's mainly in the reform that it is optional, as they say. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, orthodoxy requires it for sure. Pam. Uh, Dave has a lot of very orthodox relatives. And I've been to some very orthodox weddings and um, where they um, with the ketubah thing and then they uh, they march the, the groom in with all his things and do the ketubah signing. And I mean, it's a big deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, when do they do the ketubah signing? Uh, 
I think it was like the day before or the, I think. And then when they uh, had this ceremony, they, uh, the bride goes around in a circle around the groom. Right. This one, the bride was like 17 and she cried all the way around. <laughs> and I was sitting with the women on one side, all the, all of Dave's cousins, female cousins sitting around. And I said, you know, one of these circles, she's just going to walk out. <laughs> Which would form a halakhic problem because if the ketubah has already been signed yeah. and if certain things have already happened, then the question would arise, well, is she married? Does she require a get or is she not married? Yeah. So, um, so that, uh, and of course, the, the most serious problem is how will her father get money back from the caterer? Right. <laughs> and the answer is he's not getting any money back. And the florist. Yes. Yeah, so, but, uh, but yeah, so this is, uh, as, as so so but getting back to the ketuba itself so you you how does it differ from how we would treat that well it's a bigger deal than uh yeah steve i think it's up to the individual couples as to whether they what they want to do um you know if the rabbi demands they sign the ketuba then there's not much, much control that the couples have other than what the rabbi is saying or demanding. I guess as a reform rabbi, it's very hard for me to demand very much. <laughs> you know, people want to do what they want to do and they don't, mm -hmm. they don't see Judaism as obligating them. There's no sense of obligation. There's no sense of community standards. So they just do whatever they want. Exactly. And if I try to impose a standard, it looks like I'm being grouchy. No, it's, it's, it sounds like to me a, 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 a rabbi with a backbone rather than one that, that's just saying, okay, this is the way they want it to be done. Therefore, that's the way it's going to be. Oh, okay. Well, it's been hard to be a rabbi with a backbone, you know, that doesn't play well in certain yeah. circles. Right. Steve. Stephen, uh, Steve might appreciate it, but a lot of the couples will not. True, true. Being a rabbi is a balancing act, I've decided. <laughs> yes, yes. Bernie, comment. And you had one. Um, and uh, if Bernie gets married again, you'll fly me out to Denver to do the wedding? Um, no. You can He's say yes. Get, you're going to get a local I have, with Denver I have a rabbi? Question. Yes, Minya. At a Jewish wedding that you perform, do the bride and groom have vows that they read to each other? It's optional, yes. There's what I call uh, personal vows and statutory vows. So the statutory vows are, you know, do you, George, take Susie to be your wife, to love, to honor, and cherish her? And then George would say, I do. And then I'd say to Susie the same thing. So um, that's the statutory vows, meaning that's the legal vows. In addition or instead of, but usually in addition, before, right before that, they can, you know, speak their own personal vows. They can read read off a little uh, paper or like a pretty paper, like an index, a large colored index card that I can give them that they've written on before, or they can use notes, or they can just speak extraneously. I would say about one third of couples do that only. Most couples do not. Uh, if you do it, I like them to be approximately equal in length, but that doesn't always happen. The last time that, that there were those personal vows, the wife, the husband spoke for about a minute, and the wife spoke for about eight minutes. <laughs> Difficult. <laughs> That's the going to pre order. So married. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's why do you ask, Minya? Because I see I watch these reality shows on Netflix 
where people get married and it's always reading their own vows. The ceremony itself seems to always be very short and the vows are a major part of it. So that's why I asked. Hmm. Yes, well, it's a nice thing and it personalizes the wedding, but some people get emotional and they're not good at public speaking and they don't want to do it. Evelyn. I was just thinking that the part where, for, where it says uh, in signing the ketubah, it, it includes support, food, clothing, shelter, and sexual relations. Years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, one couldn't, the male could not get married unless he was in a position to actually support his wife. Right. right. The, women, the women did not work. They were not encouraged to work. They were encouraged to stay home and create a family as such. Uh, today, I don't think that that applies. Um, the women themselves sometimes make more money than the men do. And right. so um, the fact that there, it, is it is it valid in saying that the husband should support her? I don't. I, this is why I think they write their own vows because again, well, and, and that that indicates why the whole um, the whole world is in a big experiment that we don't know how it's going to end. You know, uh, feminism has succeeded beyond anyone's expectations, and so. They're saying, what is it, 60% and rising of college students are women, and the percentage is going up. The majority of medical students and so forth are women. And so um, men are, and there's all these articles about why are boys, and a lot of boys are just staying in their basements, playing video games all day until they venture out to shoot up a mall or something and kill a dozen people. So, you know, what's going on and how, you know, so yeah, the whole basis for traditional marriage is completely undermined. So what's going to happen, you know, when women make more money than the man and the man doesn't really uh, know how to live in society, what, what, what's the result of that? But clearly, it's harder to have traditional marriages under these circumstances, right? Well, one of the problems is that our population is declining because of this situation where you don't have the traditional marriage that produces the next generation. Uh, couples are opting not to have children, and we're finding that in order to sustain our economy, we need to have an influx of immigrants to keep the economy going. And unfortunately, that's another political situation where you have the illegal immigrants. But this country has always relied on new immigrants to keep up and sustain the population growth needed to keep supporting all of the social services that our government is supplying us with. And if you don't have workers down, you know, working down the line, Social Security and other benefits, shall we say, will cease to exist. So uh, this whole business is actually affecting adversely our entire society as such. Um, and we haven't spoken about gay marriage, you know, which didn't exist in these time in these times that we're talking about in either the biblical times or rabbinic times. But today it's a big thing. And what's also interesting is they found that that in the younger, in the under 30s, um, double or triple the number of men are single than women. So how is that possible, right, if there's about half and half? Apparently, there's a lot more women marrying each other than men marrying each other, which is not what we would have expected. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so there's a lot of lesbian marriages, more than male gay marriages. So that's also interesting. Now, is it that women like the idea of marriage more or or what what's going on? It's not a hundred percent clear to me anyway. But uh but but this is a and and now it's very well accepted, whereas you know, in the Middle Ages. If you were a woman and you said, I want to marry another woman, 
the Inquisition would grab you, both of you and you'd find yourself in a hot spot very quickly. You know, mm -hmm. haha, like being burned at the stake. I know. But, but, um, but today it's very, very accepted. And so if some, if a woman wants to marry mother, another woman, you know, that, that, it, it, nobody's even going to notice. It's just a normal thing. Uh, Evelyn. And an interesting adjunct to that is if the two women decide to create a family, one of them can be partially, artificially inseminated to create a new life. And so they would actually have a family. It would be two women and whatever child or children they decided to create, which would not be true in the sense of men uh, cohabitating together. So it's, uh, you know, the the social phenomenon today is, <laughs> it's interesting to say the least. And, and if you talk to the, like the kids in our religious school, when we had a religious school, they're young and they're raised in a new way and they don't really realize how much of a deviation from the past it is because that's the way that they were told things are when they're little. So change doesn't appear to them to be radical. They don't even realize it's change. Pam, Bernie, Pam. Well, I think the way we do things now are better because we have a live and let live attitude about what other people do and how they handle their own lives. And and I think that's a good thing that people can marry people who they want to marry. And, you know, there's no, nobody is watching them and criticizing them. It's so I think that's good the way we do things now. Uh, the Inquisition did not criticize <laughs> <laughs> they punished and threatened and right. but they didn't criticize it went way beyond that so um but our our definition of family has you know changed over time oh, and right think, yeah and i think that the change is good uh, right it, the emphasis is on much more on personal happiness as opposed for happiness for the greater good, the greater family, or society as a whole. Personal happiness is um, of primary importance today. And, you know, we attribute it to the me generation, but uh, it's what I want and what we want rather than what is better for the society as a whole. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. It is what it is as such. And in that respect, it is different from what was before. Hmm. Marsha. And when you talk about that, then you talk about whether the get is unreasonable because it's forced, if the woman wanted to leave the marriage, it's forcing her to stay in it because of the whatever the husband's opinion is. That if he says no, this isn't going to happen. You know, it doesn't happen. So it's you're that's forcing a an opinion upon someone. Like Pam says, people should be allowed to do what they want to do. But there isn't an equality of opinion on who if the marriage stays together or not. Then one person in the marriage is imposing his will, his or her will on the other. You know. Mm -hmm. His okay, I mean, I can comment on that, but let's finish the marriage part okay. and um, and we'll get to the divorce part later. Okay. Uh, Evelyn? Yeah. After signing the ketubah, the bride and groom are led to the chuppah, a wedding canopy, symbolizing the Jewish home they are about to establish. Beneath the chuppah, the birkat arusin, or betrothal blessing, is cited, including the blessing be praised, O God, who sanctifies your people Israel through the celebration of chuppah and marriage. The groom then places a wedding ring of precious value, but without jewels, upon the bride's finger and says to her, With this ring be consecrated to me as my wife in accordance with the law of Moses and the people of Israel. Among Reform, Conservative, and Reconstructionist Jews, Brides often exchange a ring and a similar vow with their bridegrooms. 
the exchange of rings is followed by the recitation of the Shiva Berachut, or seven wedding blessings. These thank God for the creation of man and woman and the desire to perpetuate God, um, perpetuate life. Ask God to provide bride and groom with the happiness of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and express the hope that the rejoicing of bride and groom will soon be heard in the land of Israel. The rabbi then presents the couple with their ketubah, and the ceremony is concluded by breaking a glass. According to some rabbis, breaking the glass commemorates the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in 70 CE. Others say that the ritual is meant to remind the bride and groom that they have obligations to the shattered within society, the poor, hungry, homeless, and helpless. Still others see in the ritual a symbolic expression of the triumph of truth, hope, and love over the persecution and suffering of the Jews throughout the ages. All of the prayers and rituals of Kedushin are meant to uplift and celebrate the love shared by bride and groom. However, the marriage ceremony is not only a public acknowledgement of their special love relationship, but it also marks the establishment of a Jewish home which guarantees the Jewish future. Through their commitments to celebrate Shabbat and holy days, to maintain their Jewish community and welfare of their people throughout the world, and to elevate their relationship through Jewish study and charity, bride and groom strengthen the Jewish people. Rabbinic interpreters understand understood that marriage was not only an institution through which human satisfaction might be achieved, but they praised it as one of the most important ingredients of the magic potion that has strengthened the Jew to survive. Despite such- Okay, stop there. That's the end of the marriage part. Any comments, Pam? No. Okay, Minya, Bernie, Marsha, Bernie. I just have one small question. There was a comment uh, as we went through this about only the conservative and reform use a double ring ceremony. Correct. I was, I was married in an Orthodox synagogue over 60 years ago, and we had a double ring ceremony. Impossible. <laughs> you mean I wasn't married? <laughs> now they tell you. I, I never, it's impossible because the the uh, whole orthodox concept is the man gives the woman something of value this is called in halacha kinyan you're acquiring her for a certain value that's what makes the wedding if she gives you something back then it's not kinyan and it nullifies the halacha element of the wedding so therefore it wouldn't be valid does it, it matter wouldn't... Does it matter that the synagogue was uh, Sephardic? I don't think so. I, it's, uh, I mean, where was this? In Baltimore. Which is the heart of orthodoxy. Are you sure? Am I sure what? That, that, that had a double that, ring? Yeah. Absolutely. Are you sure it was orthodox? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what synagogue was this? Oh, goodness. Now you got me. Um, and what was the name of the rabbi? Rabbi Green. Jacob Green. <laughs> What's his first name? Jacob, I think. Jacob. All right, let's see if we can find him because this seems <laughs> impossible. <laughs> oh, God. What was the rabbi name of the Green. Oh, oh, oh we here always he called it Rogers Avenue Synagogue. He just, died. he just died in June 2022 at the age wow. of 98. Wow. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. Yes, there he is when he was young. <laughs> um, yes, West Baltimore. Hart Zion. Um, Rogers Avenue. Um, there was a big article about him last year when he passed away. Mm -hmm. um, well... 
I think we should uh, tell the Orthodox Rabbinical Association they should dis discredit him, <laughs> take away his credentials. What about all the people he married? Austin They're not was... married. <laughs> <laughs> no, the double ring ceremony nullifies the the validity of the wedding. Oh my goodness! As far as I'm concerned, sorry to, I'm really sorry to have to tell you this, Bernie, in such a public forum. Well, it's not my problem; it's my children's and, and their children's problem. Well, they're going to come. They could sue you. <laughs> he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to give them inheritance, then, right? The well, they don't have Bernie, to. They don't have to sue me. They're going to get everything anyway. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll testify for you, Bernie, to your character. I said, Bernie is a person of really outstanding character. He never would have done a double a ring ceremony intentionally. He was misled by Rabbi Jacob S. Green, a blessed memory. I wonder <laughs> if there was a way he could have done a double ring ceremony without violating the, the, the halacha. All right, we can ask. We can we can ask an Orthodox rabbi. I I could I could ask uh, one of my Orthodox friends. Okay, you're gonna report back to us next week. Yes, we want to know. Bernie wants to know. <laughs> really, to me, it's irrelevant. It's just curiosity at this point. Well, it's uh, it's, it's it strikes me as a pretty serious matter, you know, but. Uh, but okay, we'll try to investigate. Uh, all right. Oh, and here's the grandson. This is who you could sue. Hard Sion and Rogers Avenue Synagogues. Uh, is, no, that two, is that two separate synagogues? I, I don't remember. We used to always call it the Rogers Avenue Synagogue. I don't remember the Hebrew name. Okay. I can tell it's around the corner from a good deli. <laughs> Important. Um, kind of a good Jewish neighborhood. Baltimore. Rogers Avenue Synagogue. Okay. There it is. And back then, at least, it had unchased fard attached to its name. Uh huh. Um. Okay, Hart Sion mer merged into Rogers Avenue in the nineteen fifties. Nineteen fifties? Well, I was married yeah. in the nineteen sixties. Yeah. So then it was Roger Hart Sion was no longer existing. It became Rogers Avenue. Okay. In other words, the other the other name was merged into it. What kind of name is that for a synagogue, anyway? <laughs> Obviously, not a you know not an Orthodox name. <laughs> um. Okay. Yeah, there it is. I'd. I'd... Okay. Wait, uh, Roger. Yeah. Well. All right, so we see that even in the Orthodox community in Baltimore, they do all sorts of things. <laughs> Usually, I'm betting. I'm betting that he did the second ring in a different way. I'm. I, I, I now that I think about it, I bet that when you gave your wife a ring, you said "Hare at Mikudesh Libata Badzu Kadat Mashev Israel," the traditional yeah. formulation. When she gave you a ring, it was not a double ring ceremony. He made it, he put something in between that you didn't notice. And then he had her say, Anila do diva do dili, or something else. And mm -hmm. therefore, he did not regard it as a double ring ceremony. He regarded it as a single ring ceremony that you're giving her a ring as part of Kedushin. And then later in the ceremony, even if it's just one sentence later, she's giving you a ring as a sign of her affection. And then it wouldn't be an equal exchange. It would be the main part is you giving her the ring. I think that's how he would have handled that to evade the halakhic requirement. Okay, okay, back to you, Evelyn. 
<laughs> okay, I have one thing I wanted to make a comment about where uh, the previous paragraph, it's it's from a modern treasury of Jewish thought. So this is a contemporary uh, quotation from it. And the fact that it says, uh, bride and groom strengthen the Jewish people. Um, it's the strengthening the Jew to survive. Um, it, in our culture, there are other avenues for social satisfaction. And the, the what should I say, the synagogue, the temple is no longer the center of social activity for most Jews. There are very many other things that they are interested in, that they participate in. And so the Jewish temple is incidental rather than an integral part of one's existence as it was generations ago. And therefore, I think this is one of the reasons that it is difficult to maintain Judaism, the freedom that exists in this culture where you can marry outside of the faith, where you don't necessarily have to go every single week to the temple. In other words, society has become a distraction for Jewish thought and Jewish study. And so uh, it's just it's just not as important as it would have been in a different time, in a different culture. Right. And how do you keep the the younger people interested and involved in temple activities and Jewish study when there are so many other things that they can participate in? Um, I think that's that's a problem that we're all trying to cope with with our children right. and grandchildren. Correct, and and uh, you know. When I was little, there was that option, but I, I liked the Jewish option. So I kind of chose that in a previous generation, even going back a few years before me, there really wasn't such an option. Like there was nowhere to go, you know, and so uh, so clearly that has changed a lot about marriage and and um, not so much divorce, although. When I do weddings, uh, not that I do that many, but when I do them, the parents on both sides are usually divorced and remarried. I'd say 80, 90 percent of the time you have the, you know, the bride's father and his wife, the bride's mother and his wife and so forth, if they're alive, huh. you know. And then when I did one where the the parents were really elderly that was the original marriage. So people who'd married in like the 50s or 60s are still married to the original spouse, whereas people who married in the 80s or 90s or 2000s, much more likely to have a new spouse. Hmm. And, it, you know, is that good? Is it bad? You know, I guess, you know, it depends. Uh, okay, we don't have much time, so let's keep moving. We're talking about divorce now. Okay. Despite such regard for the institution of marriage, however, rabbinic commentators were realists. They knew that some partnerships between husband and wife begin in rapture and happiness, but end in disappointment and bitterness. Rabbi Akiva observes that if a husband and wife are worthy, then God dwells between them. If they are not worthy, fire will consume them. Akiva, whose marriage to Rachel was one of passion, sacrifice, mutual support, and respect, may have been speaking from his own experience. He and Rachel endured hardship in order for him to acquire a Jewish education. Their devotion to each other was a model for their students. Akiba observed that without such shared priorities, without trust and affection that accommodates differences, marriage turns into a back battleground in a consuming fire. And we 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 had an inside seated that the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard divorce, right? They were married, right? And then 
that it went to court and uh it was just to, it was just painful to hear how they were throwing things at each other and it was just like my god you know didn't either of you think well why don't we just get divorced and end this and it was like you know they want to destroy each other how yeah. do you get to such a situation because it makes for good press yeah okay any publicity is good publicity and now they're on netflix if you want to watch the whole thing uh, i don't even want to watch it it's just Virginia is our expert of what's available on netflix this week <laughs> you want to watch the mormons with three or four wives you have that and you want to watch johnny depp and amber heard yeah. battle it out you can watch that uh pam Wait a second. The Mormons are on regular TV. Uh, <laughs> uh, the more money involved with the couple, the messier the divorce is, though. Yeah. And the more public. It and seems. more public, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But but is it necessarily the more bitter? Well, you know, the attitude is I don't care what you say about me. As long as you talk about me, they want to be in the forefront. They want to be in the public eye, no matter how yeah. closely... They look because of their yeah. immature behavior. It's, but you uh, think poor people tend to get divorced more amicably? Not as not publicly, not publicly, not not amicably at all. It's just that it's not public the way it is for those who are more prominent in the public eye. Okay. Okay, Evelyn, you keep going a little bit more. Because Jewish tradition does not rule out incompatibility between husband and wife, it accepts the tragedy and necessity of divorce. Many marry, comments a rabbinic teacher. Some succeed, some come to grief. Others express the matter of compatibility in a powerful image. When love is strong, a husband and wife can make their bed on the edge of a sword's blade. When love diminishes in strength, the wide soft bed is never large enough. Couples may marry with great expectations, feeling that they share enthusiasms, mutual passion, and a will to create a home and a family. Yet with all their good intentions, differences surface. Stress from work and unresolved tensions often lead to great unhappiness and a decision to divorce. All right, so here... People stress that Judaism is very different than Catholicism, that we allow divorce. And there are certain cases where, like Amber Heard and uh, Johnny Depp, where it would be very clear to a rabbi that this is a couple that should be divorced as soon as possible. But if they come, they say, well, we love each other, but we're having a lot of fights about topic X then maybe marriage counseling, marriage counseling might help them. But it's hard to imagine Johnny Depp and uh, Amber Heard coming out of marriage counseling and saying, oh, everything's fine now. So, uh, yes, Pam. Uh, do rabbis get training in marital, marriage counseling, or how does that work? I think rabbinical school has changed a lot. In my day, not really. I learned about counseling on my own and from, you know, from other things that I did and studied. Um, rabbinical school was um, pretty technical. Yeah. But today, I think it's changed quite a bit. You know, so it's really, it's really a different a different thing now. You know, not necessarily. I mean, not everything is an improvement either, but uh, but it's very different. Evelyn. In Rabbi Moss's case, he went ahead and got a Ph.D. in psychology and was qualified to be a marriage um, counselor, per se. And so where there were instances of marital difficulties, he was qualified, even though he was a rabbi, he was qualified to advise them and counsel them. So, but he did have special training for it. So it's, uh, again, 
uh, I, the, everything is a specialty these days. So if you want to go in for that particular venue specifically, then you have to um, take a course of study and, and pass, I presume, in order to do it. As you say, the average rabbi is in is involved in more of the technicalities of studying the the Bible, and so uh, would not be involved in the psychological aspects of interpersonal relationships as such. Um, but um, um, but but I can do it. I, I do find that when people come to me to get married, they're usually pretty focused on the ceremony and on the reception. You know, they've already decided to get married. And um, they're not even interested in um, um, genetic uh, testing. And even that includes even doctors. You know, you'd think uh, a doctor would understand that, you know, you would want to have genetic testing to make sure that there's there's not, you know, that they're both not carriers for certain diseases. Well, like they but said. They've already decided to get married. They've got a wedding coming up in six months. They're they're eager to find a rabbi and to develop the ceremony, and that's really their their primary um, focus. So, um, see but, my but rabbi. there you go. Do you see him? I see him. Now, how do I get some some voice? Yes. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, Donna. Hi, Donna. <laughs> Hi, Rabbi. Welcome back. You were, Thank you. You're... I can't stay but a second here. Uh, I had to work on getting into Zoom again, but I have a doctor's appointment. But I do want to say hi to everybody. I miss you, and I'll be there next week for sure. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Excellent. Okay, I have, good. I still have a ways to go, but I'm, I'm feeling very good. And I hope to be back on Friday night here within the next couple of weeks. Okay. Okay. Um, Steve. Uh, I think we need to start summarizing, Rabbi, because it's getting close to time. Okay. So give me four hours to summarize, Steve. Um, I'll give it. <laughs> can we cut it in half? Ten and a half seconds. Okay. So as you see, this is a huge topic. Um there's a lot of marriage ceremonies that we've talked a little bit, just a little bit about that are very interesting. Um, we express our condolences to Bernie, who thought he was really married all these years. And uh, turns out maybe maybe he was and maybe he wasn't. And uh, 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 poor, um, poor Rabbi uh, Jacob S. Green is uh, is on the firing line here maybe sued for malpractice maybe not um divorce get... is an e divorce is an even more complicated issue that we've I'll just barely it. scratched the surface of and uh so we could uh, we could spend a lot more time talking about this uh so with that i'll turn it over to steve for the final blessing and uh Oh, and um, we're we're uh, we're working on the Israel trip, so we're planning to hand out the very tentative itinerary for uh, on Friday night. We're hoping to go the congregational trip to Israel in May. Um, and um, we the Adult Education Committee also has a lot of courses which are starting the first week in October. Okay, Steve, over to you for the final blessing. Okay, let us uh, let's say it together. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Natan Olam Natan Betochenu Baruch Atah Adonai Natan Atorah. Blessed is Adonai, our God. Ruler of the universe, who has given us the teaching of truth, implanting within us eternal life. Blessed is Adonai, giver of the Torah. Okay, everyone, have a good rest of the week. Yep. And uh, I'm glad to see you back. And uh, 
Let's hope we're all feeling better next yeah. time. Yeah. Take care of yourself. Better. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a good week.